of my comments this afternoon uh, is morality in the marketplace. And in spite of the fact that the Soviet Union has now gone from the map of the world and uh, the belief in central planning uh, has basically been uh, reduced and sent off to use a Marxian phrase, the dustbin of history, the fact is that while in one sense all politicians and, and most people in the press give lip service to the idea of the free market and free enterprise, the, the, it remains no less the truth that free enterprise, the free market, the case for and an understanding of capitalism remains heavily on the defensive, both in the United States and around the world. We sometimes forget, and that includes the politicians and the newspaper columnists and the television pundits, we sometimes tend to forget all the triumphs and successes that capitalism has brought to the world. If we could go back in a time machine, let's say 250 years, to England, to France, to colonial America, what one would see then is the following. First, the world was dominated by an 18th century version of government planning known as mercantilism. All prices and wages, all industry and commerce, all imports and exports were directly and tightly controlled, regulated, and dictated by the political authorities of nation states. At the same time, there was an institution that did not just exist in one part of the world or in certain societies, but the entire world, and that was the institution of slavery. At the same time, individuals possessed very few, if any, what we today call civil liberties and political rights. Monarchies were almost always absolute. Aristocracies had privileges and favors and protections as the nobility of societies. And the common man basically lived at the pleasure and the, and the, uh, and the, uh, and the privilege of those who were the powers that be in politics and in the surrounding society. And poverty was the generally accepted condition of man. The fact is, is that the third world poverty that we take for granted when we see these pictures and photographs of many uh, countries in Asia and especially Africa today, that was the common condition of man in North America and in Europe of 250 years ago. There was political tyranny, lack of economic opportunity, low standards of living with pervasive poverty, and no sense of an appreciation of the rights and dignity of the individual. That changed in the late 18th century through two revolutions. A political revolution that was in, inspired in England but had its catalyst here in the United States with the American Revolution, and an economic revolution that began in Europe and became encapsulated in that imagery of Adam Smith's famous book, The Wealth of Nations, in which he talked about the benefits and advantages of allowing markets to be free from government regulation. And by the way, his book came out only a few months before our founding fathers signed the Declaration of Independence in 1776, a parallel of a political revolution of freedom and an economic revolution of freedom. Now, they did not transform the world immediately, particularly in the economic realm. But if one looks at the late 18th and the early decades of the 19th century, those ideas of political and economic freedom transformed all of what was then known as the civilized world, basically the European countries, and then because they had empires spreading around the world. Slowly but surely, in the early and middle decades of the 19th century, people came to have political and civil liberties, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, security in one's life and one's property, the principle of writ of habeas corpus, that one could not be wantonly taken into custody by the state and held without charges indefinitely, without being, being brought before a judge to determine whether there was sufficient grounds to hold him for a crime for which he had been accused. There was a diminishment of the government regulations and controls. The mercantilist planning state was slowly but surely dissipated, so that by the middle of the 19th century, both North America and increasingly Europe, and then because of its empires, growing parts of the globe, were practicing, if not absolute, free markets with domestic free enterprise and free trade among nations, virtually something very close to it. 
and it created an explosion of industry, enterprise, entrepreneurial innovation and creativity that resulted in rising standards of living in North America, in Europe, and then again slowly but surely spreading to the other continents of the planet. That is what capitalism achieved. It ended the tyranny of government. It established the freedom and dignity of individuals. It freed men from regulations and controls and allowed them, as long as they respected the rights and the properties of others, <coughs> the freedom of enterprise, both at home and abroad. Taxes were lowered. Broad latitudes of establishing businesses, accumulating wealth, resulted in this blossoming of what we call prosperity. Uh, I'm one of those low-tech people, both when I was a professor at Hillsdale and now. I don't do PowerPoints and stuff. Uh, I'm still s set in the 18th century with parchment and quill pen. But if I, if I had something up on, on, on the screen here, and if we were to have a diagram, let us say, of some however rough and ready and crude uh, measurement of standards of living globally from, let's say, 2,000 years ago to the present, with the vertical axis being standard of living and the horizontal axis being time. What one would see is that from, from let's say, 2,000 years ago until the beginning part of the 19th century, the line measuring standards of living would be virtually parallel to the timeline. That is, zero poverty, subsistence. But what one would see from the early and mid-decades of the 19th century and now exploding for the rest of the world is a vast increase in standards of living, all the result of the liberating of men from government regulations and controls. A lot of people are concerned today with supposedly the dark or, or less comfortable sides of globalization, internationalization of markets, outsourcing. But the fact is we should be taking a triumphant glee in this. What this means is that the other parts of the world are catching up with Europe and North America after thousands of years of poverty and becoming integrated into the industrial and commercial world with rising standards of living for their people rather than a life of unending and inescapable poverty. All done by the liberating of man through the freedom of enterprise. In spite of the short-run adjustments and, and inconveniences and, 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 and adaptations to new global economic situations, if we take the long view this is the great triumph of freedom. But looking around politics, looking upon the political debates, looking upon the types of lectures that too many of our academics deliver in their classrooms, especially in the social sciences in our colleges and universities, history, politics, sociology, even economics, what one finds a continuing argument and advocacy of intrusive government, regulating government, redistributive government, controlling government, and a lack and a suspicion of what free enterprise and free markets can produce. I want to talk about briefly three elements or aspects of this, examples of it. First I want to talk about what's come to be called social corporate responsibility. Maybe some of you are familiar with this idea. It's become very popular with with what are called NGOs, non-governmental organizations, the United Nations, international organizations like the World Bank and the IMF, and, and a growing number of governments, including and especially the European governments. And this is the idea that corporations, including American corporations, should not be focused merely upon the profit and loss of the bottom line. That corporations should not view themselves and should not be viewed by others in society as a private entity whose function is to serve the interests of its shareholders in searching out profitable opportunities to maximize dividends and shareholders' value. Rather, the corporation is supposed to be viewed as an entity not concerned with greed, selfishness, profit, but serving and being guided by the interests of the wider community. Let me suggest that if this were to be implemented in a growing number of European governments, and international organizations have been or are attempting to implement it, that this would have a dangerous impact on the future and the structure of both corporations and private enterprises in general. 
if this were to be followed, first of all, it would undermine the rights of the shareholders themselves. Now, a growing number of Americans own shares and stocks. They're part of pension plans. They're part of private and personal investment portfolios. This imagery of the rich who own the corporations, uh, the bondholders, and then there's the broad masses who have nothing to do with enterprises is a fiction, a fantasy of a long gone past. Americans are, the average Americans, through, as I said, their pension plans and their investment portfolios and so on, are the owners of corporate America. Either they will have the ultimate say, whether they only own a few shares or a large voting block of shares. Either they will be able to determine the direction and purpose and function and activities of the corporations of which they own a part share, or this will be taken out of their hands and be determined by politics and ideology, by those who have no interest in the economic betterment of the owners of that corporation, but have other agendas and purposes, even if it leads to the economic destruction of that corporation. Another way of saying this, it would politicize the use and allocation of corporate assets. It would be people in Washington and in state capitals and in local municipal governments where various companies and their branches are located would increasingly demand the determining decision as to how assets were invested, whether an enterprise could expand or contract, whether workers will be let off or other workers will be added, what the structure and nature and content of the product lines would be. And the fact is that when politics enters this, it loses all rationality. Let's remember how the market works. In the market, the means of production, land, labor, and capital, are private. Businessmen, entrepreneurs, hire rent or purchase those factors of production. They direct and guide them with what purpose? To produce products that the consuming public wants, guided by what they perceive as the prices that consumers would be willing to pay for the commodities they can bring to the marketplace. Their goal is to earn profits and avoid losses. Why? Because a loss means that your expenditures to produce the product are greater than the revenues you, you've earned from selling it to consumers at the particular price that prevails in the market. To say that the costs are greater than the revenues is to say that consumers do not value the product enough to cover the expenses of its manufacture. And that means that it shouldn't have been manufactured at all, or not in the same quantities that have actually been brought to the supply of the market. It is waste. It is inefficiency. A profit means that some entrepreneur has seen that resources are worth less than the final product those resources can produce in the eyes of the consumer, and he's rewarded with that profit. The consumers think it is worth investing those resources in making the product they want because its value is greater than its cost. That is the rationality of the market. The profit and loss system, the price mechanism, acts as the incentive and the guide to see that the scarce resources of the society are applied to where they are most highly valued. By whom? We, the consuming public, which means all of us. We are the directors of the market in our roles as consumers. And as our role as producers in our individual lines of production and the division of labor, we act on the signals that our fellow men in society give us as represented in our demands for products and those prices we're willing to pay. That connects, integrates, makes a coherent system of all that we do as individual dispersed members of a complex society. All of that would be eliminated if we politicize these processes through things such as social corporate responsibility. Because who would then determine where the investment goes, what type of resources will be invested in or not, what innovations and technological developments will be fostered and which not. The changing currents of special interest politics and ideological pulls as work not in the marketplace, but on the basis of corrupt influences of everyday politics at the national level and at the state levels. And let me suggest another element 
that such things as social corporate responsibility would result in. It would weaken the idea of individual responsibility and a sense of duty in a free society. In the free society, in a truly free society, the government has nothing to do with how you undertake the expenditure of the income you have honestly owned. You can squander it on the pleasures and the enjoyments of the moment. You can set it aside to have a large nest egg for future years. You can devote it all to the interests and needs of your immediate family, or you can show great benevolence and generosity in participating in philanthropic and charitable endeavors, both at home and abroad. It is left up to the individual. It is in the arena of freedom when individuals have to face making those choices, the present versus the future, the family versus having a benevolent sense of participation in the wider community. The individuals are forced to exercise and develop, develop the muscle of responsibility and thoughtfulness. It builds the character of a sense of charity and philanthropy in people. When the state preempts this, either by directly taxing away our income and then determine who's deserving by dispersing our tax dollars at it sees fit, or when it does so through such things as corporate social responsibility of directing enterprises at what will be invested, what will be done for social purposes, then that decision making and the exercising of that freedom of choice is taken away from us, both as income owners and as shareholders and companies. It is the end of a spirit of responsibility and freedom of choice in the arena of enterprise and the workplace. Another area where there has been many misconceptions and misunderstandings about the market, and one, in fact, I was just reading it this morning, excuse me, um, at the hotel, you know, they leave the newspaper at your door, USA Today was there. And uh, a couple of other fellows, it seems, have been taken up to charges for, well, you know, they used to talk about serial killers, right? Now they talk about serial insider traders, right? Serial, I can't help myself, I have to trade inside. I mean, <laughs> the devil is making me do it. <laughs> I hear voices, the little voices in my head tell me I have to insider trade. I mean, but that's the impression that's being tried to create here. <coughs> There's been a total misconception of the nature and the meaning and the role of insider trading, let me, let me suggest. The general impression is, is that it is inappropriate, unfair, uh, and unjust for an individual to take advantage of localized and special knowledge that they may possess before others in the marketplace, for which the Securities and Exchange Commission and so on have imposed legal restrictions. Let me suggest that this is a total misunderstanding of a certain important element of how the market works and its structure. I was a professor of economics for a lot of years. I taught students out of the standard economics textbooks. And one of the standard models in these economics textbooks is a thing called perfect competition. And in this model of perfect competition, they idealize a world of perfect equilibrium. That is a balancing of supply and demand. All revenues just equal the cost of manufacturing, so there are neither profits nor loss. Some ideal sort of end state of the market fully and completely adjusting both within a market and across many markets at the same time. And one of the assumptions that's built into this model, so as to make sure that no errors, mistakes, or omissions are made by either suppliers or demanders, is that each agent in this stylized model has perfect or sufficient knowledge. Perfect or sufficient knowledge never to make an error or mistake to miss a profit opportunity or to avoid a loss that could have uh, not been suffered. And that becomes sort of like a stylized benchmark that economists for decades have used to judge and evaluate, quote, the real world. Well, the fact is, is that such a presumption of perfect or sufficient knowledge never to make omissions, mistakes, or to know things before others is just inconsistent with the reality of the world. There's a famous free market Austrian economist named Friedrich Hayek, maybe some of you have heard of him, famous author of The Road to Serfdom and other works. Well, he was given the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1974. And one of the reasons he was given this Nobel Prize 
is for a famous article that he wrote in 1945 called The Use of Knowledge in Society. And the core essence of this article was that we all understand that there's a division of labor in society and the efficiency and productivity that arises from it. One is the butcher, one is the baker, another is the candlestick maker. And we specialize in what we discover we're most productive and efficient at, and we trade our specialized productivities with each other mutually for a higher standard of living than if we had to work in self-sufficient isolation. But he went on to emphasize that another element of a division of labor is that inseparable from that is a division of knowledge. By definition, to specialize in being the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker means that you possess certain types of specialized knowledge that others don't. So you know certain things in your corner of the market that others in all the other corners of the market may have no appreciation, knowledge, or understanding of. Now, one implication of that is that when any change, new circumstance in either supply or demand somewhere in the market occurs, then that means that given that change, someone is going to know it first. He who is probably most locally situated near where the change has, has occurred. Okay. The purpose of the market is to disseminate this information that a change has happened through a willingness to demand, the ability to supply, <coughs> the price at which one would sell or purchase, so that others can know that a change has occurred to which all now must in some incremental way adapt and adjust to so the market can be kept in a working and functioning balance and harmony. That means that when a change in circumstance, supply, demand, technology, information of any sort occurs, we want people to have the liberty and the latitude to inform others about it as quickly as possible so as not to create lags or delays or unnecessary errors and mistakes by not adjusting and adapting to the new circumstances as quickly as is humanly and technically, technologically possible. We want people to start acting and marketing on the basis of new knowledge they possess. In fact, in that sense, insider trading, I'm using that in the broader sense, is inseparable from people effectively functioning in a market. Your decision to pay more for a resource as a producer, your decision to invest in something more or less in a particular way based upon new circumstances, start sending out signals of demand and supply and price to everyone else in the market, like a pebble dropped in a pond of water and the ripples then spread out. Anything that prevents or delays this, prevents and delays the market from doing its job, coordinating everything we do in a world of constant change. The only ethical issue, let me suggest, is whether a person working for a business or a corporation has contractually agreed or not, as terms of their employment, to not use certain types of information that they may acquire for certain investment and other purposes in the market. If I have signed a contract at the time of my employment saying that I will not use certain types of information that come my way first without permission or understanding or agreement, with those who have employed me. Unless that's the case, then I don't see that there's any ethical or legal problem with insider trading. Let me suggest that if insider trading had been functioning better, some of the scandals that have draw, gotten our attention in the last several years, such as Enron, might not have been as great as they turned out to be. Because of the insider trading laws that came into effect in earlier years, it prevented people who were in Enron and who started smelling, sensing that maybe something was being done above them that wasn't quite right, that might be not really the truth, from acting upon it. Imagine if some of those people who started getting a whiff that things were not everything that was said publicly had started trading Enron's shares and obviously selling them, which would have put downward pressure on those share prices a lot faster and sooner than they did. Would that not have sent out signals to other people to ask questions, public statement, 
share price declining. Maybe I should be hesitant. Maybe I should want to know more. Maybe I should expect greater information from the corporate officers. If that's those signals had been sent out earlier, then maybe the, the scandal of it all would have been prevented from reaching the magnitude that it did and a lot earlier. And by the way, let me say, is that even with such insider trading restrictions, it was the market, through, in, in, through market information and share price movements, that sent out the first signals that maybe something was wrong with the behavior of some people further up the ladder. And only then did the government decide to take legal investigations to see if something had been done that shouldn't be under the law. The market sent the signal that only then the government responded to. But that signal could have been sooner and more effective, if not for the fears of some people coming under legal restrictions against insider trading. The other thing that I want to briefly touch upon as an example of this is the impressions, the stereotypes that too many Americans and certainly people around the world have about business and environmental issues. Now certainly the environment is important. We live in the environment, we, we breathe air, we, 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 we have our, our, our circumstances of not wanting a dirty, filthy, polluted environment. But there's a general impression and attitude in our society in general, and certainly among the political elite and the journalistic pundits and the academics in our colleges and universities, that most, if not all, of the environmental problems are the product and the result of greedy, selfish, short-sighted businessmen and entrepreneurs who have total disregard for the surrounding environment. As long as they make a profit today, they have no concern about how they leave the planet tomorrow. Where do most of our pollution and environmental problems come from? If not the virtually all of them. In my humble opinion, it comes from the fact that we do not have in place, either in terms of being defined or enforced, that, the, that institution that always, uh, to use the lingo or the jargon of the economist, tends to internalize these negative externalities. And what is that institution? Private property. You live in a house or an apartment. Imagine if your neighbor started throwing garbage over, over the fence into your backyard, or started throwing garbage from his side of the apartment onto your side. You would immediately call upon him to cease and desist. And if he didn't, you would call upon the police. My property has been violated. He has not my permission to pollute my backyard. And he either would have to reach an agreement with you to pay you a price sufficient to make it your worthwhile to put up with part of his garbage in your backyard, or he would have to cease and desist and cart it away in some other way, or devise some way of eliminating it that would have, have a negative impact on you. Where are the pollution problems? The air, the rivers, the lakes, the oceans? What is the air, the rivers, the lakes, and the oceans? Common property. There's no private property there. There could be, and historically there should be. You know, most, some of the weakening of private property rights in these common waterways began here in the South. There's a very interesting book that came out about, oh, it must be at least 20 years ago, called The Transformation of American Law. And one of the interesting things in this book, to be honest, it's been so long I can't even remember the author's name, but I, I read it when it came out. But what he says is that at the, after the, there used to be property rights in rivers, streams, and lakes. Your property right lines would run out to the middle of the river, the middle of the lake, etc. And if anyone upstream or around the lake wanted to do something that would result in a polluting uh, of your adjacent water property rights, they would have to get your permission or pay some compensation to you through contractual arrangement with you, or they would have to cease and desist, or you could have legal recourse to make them stop. But you see, in the post-Civil War years, 
the new southern governments were attempting to attract industry for reconstruction. How do you make it attractive, profitable, for northern industry to come south? Well, one of the ways that some of the southern states did, they weakened or abolished property rights in river streams and like, come, come down south. Build a factory along a river. And if your byproduct pollutes the river, you no longer have property rights, obligations with the people downstream. We've made it a common area, no longer private property. That's how some of these problems, if not the vast majority of them, have arisen. If we privatize these common areas, if we more clearly define and enforce property rights that we generally recognize in the society, let me suggest that the vast majority, if not all of our common everyday pollution problems and environmental problems would tend to disappear. There is nothing more effective than the incentive motives of making profits and avoiding losses. And avoiding losses is damages to your neighbor's property. What's the alternative to this? Politicizing it? Oh, as if politicians and bureaucrats take long-run views of the benefits of society. We all know that in the real world, what do politicians think about the next electoral cycle. They don't think beyond two or four years. A businessman has to be thinking of what's going to happen five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, with the property and the investment and the enterprise that he's undertaking. The market could be this, precisely because it would apply and put into place the motives and incentives of the creativity of individual minds, given the constraints of not doing harm to one's neighbor. Not doing harm to one's neighbor. That finally gets me to the most important part of the market and the role of the businessman in society. And that is the marketplace has a core and inescapable and profoundly important moral element to it and that is the dignity and respect for the individual. And how is that dignity and respect of the individual demonstrated in the marketplace? By, that all, by the fact that all human relationships, all associations, all transactions are based upon free and voluntary consent and agreement. I may not kill you. I may not steal from you. I may not defraud you. And all of these are part of an older code than even the Declaration of Independence. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Is that not fraud and deception? Follow those basic rules in human relationships. And not only does the society have greater honesty, but it has respect and dignity for each individual. And that is the essence of the market. It harnesses self-interest, as Adam Smith explained long ago, to serving the public good. Because if you have something that I want, the only way I can do it is by offering you something in trade that you're willing to take because you value what I have more highly than what I want from you that you presently possess. Not a society of morality. That was the type of society that America was founded upon. Let me give you an example of the, the imagery of that earlier America. We're all familiar with the famous Frenchman, Alexis de Tocqueville, who in the 1830s had traveled to America, toured the country for several months, went back to France, and wrote his famous book, Democracy in America. There was another Frenchman who also traveled to the United States in the 1830s. His name was Michel Chevalier. He too went back to France after spending about six months in that early America. And he too wrote a book about his experiences, which in fact was translated into English in 1839. This is just a passage from his book, from 1839, based upon his, his impressions. The manners and customs are altogether those of a working and busy society. That's what America is about. The American is a model of industry, he said. At the age of 15 years, a man is engaged in business. At 21, he is established. 
He has a farm, a workshop, his counting house, or his office. In a word, his employment, whatever it may be. He now also takes a wife, and at 22 is the father of a family, and consequently has a powerful stimulus, a stimulus to excite his industry. A man who has no profession, and which is nearly the same thing, who is not married, enjoys little consideration. He, who is an active and useful member of society, who contributes his share to augment the national wealth and increase the numbers of its population, he only is looked upon with respect and favor. The American is educated with the idea that he will have some particular occupation, that he is to be a farmer, an artisan, a manufacturer, a merchant, speculator, lawyer, physician, or minister, perhaps all of these in succession, and that if he is active and intelligent, he will make his fortune. He has no conception of living without a profession, even when his family is rich, for he sees nobody about him not engaged in business. The man of leisure is a variety of the human species of which the Yankee does not suspect the existence. And he knows that if rich today, his father may be ruined tomorrow. Besides, the father himself is engaged in business, according to custom, and does not think of dispossessing himself of his fortune. If his son wishes to have one at present, let him make it himself. And guiding all of this was a spirit of competition and competitiveness. And Chevalier, just one more passage quickly. Unlimited competition is the sole law of labor, everyone being his own master. An American's business is always to be on the edge, lest his neighbor get there before him. If a hundred Americans were, ag were about to go before the firing squad, they would start fighting for the privilege to go first. So used are they to competition. <laughs> that was the imagery of the early America of freedom and enterprise as seen through the eyes of a Frenchman who is coming here to observe, listen, learn, and take back his imagery of America to his fellow Frenchmen. Enterprise, hard work, diligence, changing professions and occupations, expecting to make one's own way, competitive drive in all that is done. That is what made America great. That was the spirit of enterprise, the morality of the market, the ethics of businessmen. We give lip service to it. And even sometimes the pundits and the politicians, as I said at the beginning, do so. But the fact is, is that the core, the essence, the true meaning of it has been lost. That's what we need to recapture. That's what we can recapture. You know, the 20th century was a terrible century. It was a century of every conceivable collectivism being tried and then failed. Socialism, communism, fascism, Nazism, interventionism, welfare statism, and all have left in their wake wreckages and disasters of one sort or another. The extreme ones, death and destruction. The less extreme and violent ones, poverty and corruption and abuse. What's left? There is only one idea and ideology that I would suggest whose time has once again come. And that is capitalism. The ideology of individual liberty, private property, dignity, and enterprise. Our mission, your mission, my mission, all of our missions of those who believe in the importance of liberty is to redouble our efforts to see that none of those isms or any other variation on it come back again to dominate the world. To assign ourselves the task of spreading the idea of liberty, its principles, its applications, and the dangers of its various opposites. If we do, if we have the courage and the integrity, and if we take the time to learn the idea sufficiently, 
to feel confident, to articulate it to others. The 21st century that we live in, and certainly that we leave to our children and grandchildren, can return to those ideals that the Founding Fathers laid down in the establishment of our country. And if we reestablish them and practice them here, we can again be that beacon on the hill to serve as a glorious example for the rest of the world. Thank you very much. My answer is that in a, in a free market economy, the amount that you earn, whether it be great, small, is a matter of how others evaluate and value the services you can perform for them, your, uh, their, your fellow men. Let's think of the, of the Hollywood movie star, the box office success, or the multi-million dollar baseball, football, or basketball player. They walk around with huge sums of money, hundreds of millions of dollars sometimes, either over a short period of time or over a lifetime. What do they do? Some guy goes before a camera and, and blabbers away in some action movie, right? Another person goes out on a sports field and dribbles a ball or, or, or catches a pass and goes across to make a touchdown, and he makes tens and tens of millions of dollars. Okay, Where, what has been the basis of this? One thing, that those who enjoy the movie or those who take the pleasure from observing and watching the sport are willing to pay to see those people who they view as stars and excellent and good players perform in ways that give them pleasure and entertainment and enjoyment. That's the determining factor of how much people should earn. What those who buy the products or the services think their services are worth. If Bill Gates makes 20 times what he does, if he's done it on an open competitive market, making the computer version of a continually better mousetrap, I don't care. He has not made one dollar that does not represent what someone has freely chosen to spend on one of the products that he's bringing to market. Anything else to put caps and limits on that is the politics of envy and a misunderstanding of the nature of the profit and loss system of the market. Anyone who says, that, that, that's immoral, that's outrageous, how could anyone earn that much unless they're doing something wrong or immoral or illegal, just does not understand the market and is just demonstrating their own sense of, of greed, uh, envious greed, in, in, in not wanting someone to do better than themselves, or their own ethical standards of what they think should be some norm of maximum income. Those people are free to persuade others to charitably give away their income or to give away some of their own income. But it is immoral to set a cap or to try to take away what others have honestly acquired in the marketplace. That's my view of it. Okay, I can either be tactful or I can be honest. So I'll be honest. <laughs> and I don't mean to offend people because I know this is a fiery, emotional, and controversial topic. Which is why I want to hear it. I believe, I personally, both from an ethical point of view and I believe as an economist on the nature of how markets work, I'm an advocate of free immigration. I believe that just as everyone here in this room is the descendant of some one or some group of people who came as immigrants at an earlier generation, the same thing should be allowed with another generation of immigrants. Why did our ancestors come here? Everyone in this room, religious persecution, political oppression, lack of economic opportunity, usually again because of something that a foreign government was doing in their home country. They wanted a new start. Who are these people? Our ancestors. They tended to be young, they tended to be hardworking, and they were risk-taking. Okay, it's not easy to leave one's home country, culture, family, language, everything that is familiar that is a orientation of one's life. And to give all that up, to start anew, to adapt to a new society, new culture, new language, new way of doing things. Between 1840 and 1920, approximately 60 million people left Europe to come to either North America, South America, or Australia and New Zealand, then some to South Africa, okay? Out of that 60 million, 
approximately 35 to 40 million from 1840 to 1920 came to the United States. They all immersed themselves and adjusted to American society, or they went back to their home countries, and many did go back if they couldn't adjust and adapt. Okay, all the things that we hear today were heard then. Oh, those Germans, and a large wave of Germans came in the 1860s and 1870s trying to avoid military conscription under Bismarck. All those Germans, you know, they all clustered together. They all speak German, and they won't learn English. And all they want to do is to listen to those um papa bands, drink steins of beer, and eat sauerkraut. Oh, they'll never become real Americans. And then the Irish. Then the wave of Irish. Oh, gosh. They beat their wife. They're all drunks. And they worship the Pope. They can't be true Americans. Okay. And then the same thing with the Italians, <coughs> and the Poles, and the Russians, and Eastern European Jews, and, 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 and. Well, all the, all the processes of these earlier waves of immigration show that by the second and third generations, they just immerse themselves in the wider society. And by the time they're the grandchildren of the original immigrant, the grandchildren are slightly embarrassed with grandma and grandpa. You know, they talk funny. They're kind of different. This will happen, in my opinion, in an open environment of new waves of immigration. Now, what are some of the problems that people talk about today, which I don't mean to disregard or be insensitive to? A major problem is people are concerned with supposedly the, the drain on social services, public education, the health care system, et cetera, et cetera, of immigrants, particularly illegal immigrants. Well, I think there's a very simple solution. And that is to say, anyone who's gotten here illegally can stay. Anyone who wants to come here can come. But just to pick it a, a, a number, for the first 10 or 15 years that you are here, neither you nor your family are eligible for any of the welfare state programs. You make it on your own, like earlier generations before the welfare state. Private philanthropy, charity, self-help in local communities, fine, that's how earlier generations, your great-grandparents and my grandparents adjusted to America. But no social services. Language, that's a problem. But why? That has to do with the fact that people want to come here. It's our own homegrown problem. Oh, multilingualism, the educational system, oh, you have to let them speak their original language. No. But let people to adjust to the society. And most of those people, the vast majority of them, like early generations, will learn English, adapt to American culture, and now because of technology, to a great extent, by watching television. My wife is from Russia. We met in Moscow. When we got married, I inherited a 16-year-old daughter, my stepdaughter. She had been studying English, but she didn't really know English very well. So we get married a few months later because of the visa stuff. We bring her daughter, now my stepdaughter, over. And she had part of a summer before she was starting college uh, at Hillsdale College, because that's where I was teaching at the time. And so the entire summer, she had nothing to do right before the fall term began. You know, she, she, she just sat in her room most of the time watching television, right? American sitcoms, including the old ones, like I Dream of Jeannie, you know, from the 60s. Well, by the end of the summer, her English had gotten a lot better. Significantly better that she had basically no problem in beginning the semester, her first semester at Hillsdale College. Now, I know, and as far as taking away jobs from Americans, well, that's the, that is sort of the lump of labor argument, that there's sort of like this lump of labor with only a certain given number of jobs. The fact is, is that the labor market and the demand for labor is flexible, dynamic, and expandable. There are as many, there's as much work to do as hands available. Now, yes, there's some immigrants come and compete against existing segments of the labor force? Yes. But imagine if there were no immigration, you just had natural growth in population by people having four or five kids instead of this, what, 1.5 kids now. Would not that increase in the working population and then reaching working age uh, put some downward pressures on 
those sectors of the labor market where they entered as new entrants? Of course, that's part of supply and demand. But the point is, is that it's the dynamic process by adding hands to do more work to bring about a rising standard of living, as earlier waves of immigration did. I think we need to take the long view, the commonsensical view, the economic understanding view, and the ethical view. None of us would be here if American borders had not been a lot freer when our ancestors came. It seems a little inconsistent to now say it was okay for our grandparents or great-grandparents to come, but now the next generation of people who want a chance are to have the door shut in their face. I know that's very unpopular, but I'm just trying to tell you what I think. Well, you see, the problem that I have is not that lawyers have fees, even big fees, but, but, the, but the change in the perception of where responsibility lies, or liability lies, in the, in the legal system over the last several decades. There used to be a phrase, very common in law, caveat emptor, the buyer beware, the customer beware. Of course, there's, the law has always recognized laws against fraud and misrepresentation. I mean, if someone sells you, tells you that sending you a, selling you a healthy cow, and it arrives and it's a dead cow, that's fraud and misrepresentation. The law has always been, had restrictions on that. But what has happened is that there's also been the notion is that the, that the customer is expected to show a certain amount of reasonable pursuit of information in making his decision before the purchase. And that as long as the producer, the supplier, did not misrepresent and defraud him, that the burden of proof of such misrepresentation and fraud falls upon the buyer not uh, the, the seller being put absolutely on the defensive. It's a change in, in where the burden of responsibility lies. And I'm using responsibility in that broader sense here, responsibility for the choices one makes, uh, that, has, that has generated a lot of these, these absurd legal processes and decisions. And, and that requ requires a change in, in, in the focus of, of where, where responsibility lies in the law, legal code, not the fact that a lawyer makes money. They're just responding to, often they pressured for it. I understand that. The lawyers, are, the, the change in the legal system is not independent of the lobbying pressures of the lawyers themselves in some cases. But the fact is that given the institutional change in, in what the law views as where liability may lie, the lawyers are just responding to the incentives of the, of, of the institutional system. So it's the institutions that need to be changed, the, the basis of, of where responsibility lies. Okay, thank you very much.